We'll welcome everybody uh, to this, the launch of the Climate Commission's 27th report. This is a particularly important report, as you'll soon hear um, from the authors. But before we go into that, I'd like to introduce um, everyone who is here today. Uh, from the Climate Commission, we have the two report authors, Professor Will Steffen and Professor Leslie Hughes. We also have Professor Vina Sahajwala in the audience, uh, another of our commissioners. And as special guests of the Commission today, we have over here um, Admiral uh, Chris Barry, AC, former Chief of the Defence Force of Australia, Simon McKeown, uh, 2011 Australian of the Year, Chair of the CSIRO and Executive Director of Macquarie Group. We also have Dr Cassandra Goldie, CEO of the Australian Council of Social Services, and Dr Brian Owler, New South Wales President of the Australian Medical Association. And all will speak uh, in their turn. I'll be brief, but I just want to say a couple of things about this report. It is, in my view, the most important of all of the Commission's products to date. It is being released um, about a quarter of the way through what we have called the critical decade. This is the decade where we need to take strong action to avoid the dangers of climate change. It makes a number of very strong points, but one of the most important is that the the risks that climate scientists foresaw sometimes years ago are now in many instances being realised. We're starting to see the shift in climate happening and that the pathway forward has never been clearer. We know what to do. There are now uh, a, a number of trials and experiments being uh, conducted around the world. We know the methods that work to deal with climate change. We simply need to redouble our efforts. Having said that, I'll hand over to Professor Will Steffen, our lead author, um, to explain more about the report. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks very much, Tim. As Tim mentioned, uh, this report is two years on from our first report, The Critical Decade, and a lot's happened in, in two years. First of all, the climate science itself has strengthened quite considerably. Uh, there's no doubt, absolutely no doubt whatsoever, that the Earth is warming. It's warming at a rapid rate, and the main cause for that warming is the emission of greenhouse gases from the combustion of fossil fuels. But we move on very quickly from that well-understood science to look at a couple of things that I think are quite interesting that have developed over the past two years. As Tim mentioned, we started making projections around 1990. Our climate models were good enough then to start projecting what might happen. A little over two decades down the track, many of those projections are now observations. They're now realities. We see that the air temperature has gone up, ocean temperature has gone up, sea level has gone up. Ice and snow are, are disappearing. The Arctic sea ice, in fact, is disappearing faster than even the most pessimistic models said it would. And we're starting to see significant losses and increasing rates of loss of ice from Antarctica and from Greenland, which, of course, is contributing to, to sea level rise. The other thing that's happened, I think, in the last two years has been a much better understanding of the link between climate change and extreme weather. Extreme we weather is really what matters for Australians and many people around the world. And, it's re and climate change is raising the risk. And we actually see this being played out today in Australia. And my colleague, Leslie Hughes, and co-author, who's done most of the work on, on the risk section and impact section, is going to speak just a moment in more detail about what that actually means for us. But I think the, the, the back end of the report is, is really quite significant. Because for the first time, I think the scientific community has really connected the dots on what all this means. First of all, we've provided a lot of input to the judgment that countries around the world, including Australia, have made that we want to limit climate change to a temperature rise of no more than two degrees above pre-industrial. That's policy. It's been accepted by both sides of Australian politics. It's been accepted by most countries around the world. But so far, there's been a disconnect with that, between that policy target and emissions of CO2. We're connecting the dots in this report. And it's quite clear, to meet that policy target, there is a limited amount of CO2 that can be emitted. Scientists normally do this calculation between the year 2000 and about mid-century when we have to have decarbonized the economy. And the budget's a nice number to remember. It's about a trillion tons of carbon dioxide, and that sounds like a lot. Two implications of that. One is in the first 13 years since 2000, we've consumed about 40% of the budget. Far, far too fast. We've only got 60% left. Second, when you put absolute numbers on that, what you find is that we can use only 20% of the fossil fuel reserves, the coal, oil, and gas that are in the ground, to stay within that budget and keep a manageable climate for our children and grandchildren. That's the crux of the problem. 
And this report, I think, puts it in, in, in quite clear contrast using very simple numbers, well-established calculations. To make these goals compatible, we have to transition to clean energy sources and do it fast. So that's the bottom line of this report. Now I'll let Leslie tell you a bit more about the risks that climate change is now posing for us. Thanks, Will. Thank you, everyone. If climate change wasn't going to have any impacts, we wouldn't be worrying about it. And what this report shows is that some of the impacts of climate change are already being felt, and we also summarise the scientific projections for, for what impacts we might expect in the future. So amongst those, we are already seeing our ecosystems changing, we are already seeing our species moving in response to climate change and their life cycles changing. We are already seeing things like the degradation of the Great Barrier Reef due to warming temperatures and bleaching. Um, we have seen in recent years the impacts of heat waves on our cities, um, especially on those most vulnerable in our society. We are also seeing the impacts of drought on our agriculture and we have projections in the report as to the future of our food security in Australia. Um, the report outlines um, how uh, the recent extreme weather that we've seen over last summer and in recent years really offers us a window on the future of what we might expect in the future. So um, with that, I'm going to hand over now to Admiral Chris Barry, who will speak to you. Thanks, Leslie. I'm sure some of you might ask why is somebody like me standing up here and uh, talking to this particular report. Uh, it's the second report in a sequence of reports that the Climate Commission is publishing, and I think it's a report of great concern. Uh, where I first became involved in the issues was uh, a few years ago after reading a book called Our Final Hour by Martin Rees. Uh, Martin Rees, uh, in this book, predicts that by 2100, there's a one in two chance there'll be no human beings left on the planet. Now, I'm not sure about you, but where I sit says to me, Martin might well be wrong, but he also might be right. And when I think about my granddaughter and her life expectancy, I think this is a problem we've got to take very seriously and work on. Uh, Martin Rees happens to be the Astronomer Royal and was once the President of the Royal Society in the UK, so uh, he's not a slouch when it comes to some of this sort of work. Now about the defence interest, um, well we're the guys that sweep up after climate change consequences. If you lived in a flood zone in Queensland or in a bushfire affected area in Victoria, you know it's the Defence Force that's going to come along and try to help people who are in distress over these extreme weather events. Uh, and we need to stay in touch with global change. We need to stay in touch with where climate consequences are going to have more and more impact on the sort of work we do. Uh, so we see, uh, in terms of our preparedness issues of, as I say, extreme and more frequent weather events, we see health issues as a consequence we see food security issues and energy security issues. So there's a whole panoply of issues that we need to stay in touch with. That's what we're working on, and we're trying to devise uh, where do we need to go in our future planning to deal with these sorts of issues. And finally, of course, uh, it just seems to me we can't solve this problem uh, down in Canberra, and we can't just leave this problem to people uh, in our local communities. All of us have to pull together in trying to meet these challenges. What we really are demanding is a change in human behaviour if we're going to make this work. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to Simon McKinn. Thanks very much, uh, Admiral. I've been asked to dwell on a couple of things briefly. Firstly, what does this mean for the, the common man or person in the street, and secondly, a word or two from the perspective of business. A couple of months ago, uh, whilst in the US, Stephen Hawking, who's got to be one of the great thinkers of the age, said in actually quite a matter-of-fact way that he doubted that the Earth would be inhabitable in a thousand years' time. He said it would be toxic, we would have fleed as a species somewhere else. Now, of course, personally, I hope he's wrong. Uh, I probably won't be around then to be able to determine that, but uh, there is no doubt in my mind that we have the science that can prevent such an outcome. The issue is, though, whether we have the attitude, the will, the desire to um, allow the science to do what it can actually do. 
I really do want to commend this uh, fabulous latest instalment on the, um, the growing edification of this species about climate change from Professors Will Steffen and Leslie Hughes. It's actually written in a way that the common person like me, not a trained technical person, can actually understand. And what was briefly mentioned before, the fact that we've tried to look at a 50-year period and what the allowable, if you like, emitting of CO2 might be to contain temperature rises to around 2%. And most importantly, of the 13 years in that 50-year period, what have we actually emitted? 40%. We have 37 years for the remaining 60%. The trend is really obvious. Even someone as dumb as me can understand that. And it is important that the common person does understand this because ultimately it's not businesses, I would argue it's not governments that actually will play the most important role in disproving Stephen Hawking's theory but it's actually us. The good news uh, is that CSIRO conducted a survey not so long ago and the, uh, the number of Australians who actually are sceptical about the science, it's way less than 10%, so that's not the issue anymore, I would argue. The issue is just that one that I referred to before, will, the fortitude. Um, sadly, I think that there's some members of the younger generation who, who actually know very well what the issue is, but would just give up saying it's actually too hard, not just the younger generation. And indeed, from an Australian perspective, we're a small nation, small country, it's a global issue, what the heck can we do? Well, I'm not going to dwell on that this morning, but it does start with each and every one of us actually having a conviction that we can actually make an important change. From the perspective of business, business has from time immemorial, had to get its mind around risk. And by and large, it doesn't do it too badly. If it doesn't do it very well, it generally goes out of business. Kodak is a shell of what it used to be. But companies have to adapt. Indeed, uh, there was one that used to be based here, James Hardy. I'm not here to talk about how it treated uh, asbestosis claims. However, it did actually totally transform the product that it used to uh, produce. And modern cement sheet, actually, its product dominates the US market. It changed, it adapted, it ended up still leading the world. And that's what business has to do all the time. In relation to climate change, I would suggest that actually, relative to 20 years ago, business has a very good understanding of climate change. It will digest this report this morning as it does with everything else. Um, business does have the products, the services, whatever we need uh, as a community to deal with climate change. What it struggles though with is sometimes just leading. It does come across as conservative, not um, perhaps drawing the community's attention enough to what the issue is. Um, the other issue of course with business is that it needs to be across behavioural science as well as climate science because uh, it's not appropriate to invest heavily in a product today that not actually, will not actually be taken up by the community for a, a period to come. Can I just close in uh, saying that in relation to the Australian coal industry, yes, we have large quantities of coal. And I think it is right, obviously, from a national perspective, to invest in uh, research and development that can at least deal with what this report is saying is a very obvious problem. If we simply extract the coal out, burn it in the way that we do today, the formula simply won't work. It seems obvious a, a national challenge to me that if there was any way in which our best and brightest in the labs can actually assist in the clean burning of that coal, then that's uh, obvious. But that is not to say that there's a silver bullet. The reality is, and the uh, main point that comes for me out of this report, is that many of the identified uh, fossil um, fuel reserves will have to remain in the ground permanently. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Cassandra. That's right. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Simon. My name is Cassandra Goldie. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Council of Social Service, which is the peak body for community services around Australia and the national voice for people who experience poverty and inequality. 
I want to commend the uh, Climate Co uh, Commission for what is one of the most important reports we have seen for a very long time. Because what it does is it tells us all what I think we have known from our personal experience, that we now know going into every change of weather season that we are going to experience major extreme weather events and that there is no question that that is linked to climate change. And we have absolutely no choice but to come together with the shared responsibility of taking very determined action to deal with it. Our sector deals with the human experience of not acting. We have people, one in eight people in Australia who live in poverty and one in six children. Right around Australia, thousands of community workers are working with people who are desperately trying to recover, and they may never recover from the impact of having been through a flood, or two floods, or three floods and um, a bushfire. These are the stories that we hear every day. We have recently interviewed our community organisations around the country about what this is meaning for them out there. They are deeply concerned and are urging all of the national leaders to make concrete decisions to act. We know right now, our community organisations, that along with Defence are the army and for the long term in helping communities to recover and to adapt, are deeply concerned that without concerted action, a quarter of them will disappear overnight if they are hit by an extreme weather event and another 50% may never get back into a position to be providing the kind of important services to people who are old, to people who have disability, to um, young families who have no money. They are the front line and they are telling us from the bottom up that we have a national responsibility and a shared responsibility to take the findings of this report very, very seriously. We cannot ignore the fact that right now more people in Australia die from extreme heat than die on our national roads. We have to hear the facts and be prepared to act. ACOS and all of our members are very committed to working across with uh, defence, uh, with public policy decision makers and with all of us in the community and business leaders to be working on the co sometimes complex solutions. But not all of them are complex. For example, we know that energy efficiency matters. We can put into our own hands the power to make a difference. What we do need is for our constituents who don't have a lot of money, they need the support and help to make the modifications in their homes because they want to do it, but they need the resources and the support and financing to do it. I can go on with many of the other solutions, but I think the main message from us today is as the national voice um, wanting to protect people from poverty and inequality. We know that if we don't act, it is the people who have the least who are hit the first and the worst by our failure to act on climate change. And we urge all those in Australia to listen to the findings of this report and for us to come together with the kind of custodianship for the nation and globally that we need to make sure that our future for our children and for our children's children is the right one and not the wrong one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Cassandra. Um, it is a pleasure to be here today to represent the Australian Medical Association. I'm the president in New South Wales, but also represent the federal AMA. And as the AMA and as doctors, we um, care about the health of our community. This means not only providing the best care to the patient that's in front of us, but also looking at what communities and governments can do uh, to reduce the incidence of disease and injury. And today's report and its predecessors confirm that climate change is a public health issue uh, and one that governments and communities should be taking seriously, planning for and acting on. When they think about climate change, I think a lot of people think about uh, coastal erosion, about rising sea levels, maybe the effects on agriculture. However, there are more immediate implications for the health of Australians and for government to consider in terms of health policy and for health systems. 
The implications for health are multiple, but today I want to focus on two. The first is the increase in the frequency of extreme weather events, and these include heat waves, very hot days, floods and storms. And as doctors, we see the consequences of these events through our emergency departments of our hospitals, through our general practices, but also through our emergency services. All of us remember the tragedy of the Queensland floods in 2010-2011, in which 35 lives were lost. And fatalities and injuries, as tragic as they are, are only one health consequence of an event such as a flood. The Queensland flood was estimated to have affected 2.5 million people. And for those 2.5 million, the other health consequences may have included diseases from water con contamination, foodborne diseases, lapsed chronic disease management from unavailability of health resources or loss of health infrastructure. It may have included mental health issues as a result of dislocation, loss of income, or of course the experience of the event itself. Heat is said to be a silent killer and its contribution to death and illness has become increasingly recognised in our health system. In fact, very hot days and heat waves can be equally devastating for people as some of the more dramatic floods and cyclones. As cited in this report, in January 2009, a heat wave in Victoria was thought to be responsible for an excess of 374 deaths. Sadly for us as a community, it's often the most vulnerable people in our community, the elderly, those with chronic illnesses, and unfortunately children that bear the brunt of these events. The second important issue is that of disease. Climate and disease are linked. If we change the pattern of the climate, we change the pattern of disease. And for Australia, changes in temperature and rainfall will have implications, particularly in tropical diseases, those that are carried by mosquitoes, such as Ross River virus and dengue fever. We will see an increase in frequency and distribution of these, these diseases. Health authorities and governments must be alert to these uh, possibilities, as these changes can be insidious, and surveillance and other strategies aimed at mitigation of disease through vector control need to be in place. The AMA's policy on climate change calls for a national strategy for health and climate change. It incorporates many of these issues and includes local uh, disaster management plans, strong and active communication linkage linkages between hospitals, major medical centres, weather forecasts and emergency response uh, agencies, measures targeted at the needs of the vulnerable members of our community, interventions to address mental health issues and measures to present, prevent exotic diseases, disease vectors from becoming established in Australia. The Critical Decade Report not only highlights the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but the urgent need for governments and our health systems to prepare for the health consequences of climate change that are already in train. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful uh, to our special guests for being with us today. They really represent some of our greatest national leaders across the spectrum of the things that we do, from defence to medical, health to social services to business. And we have an opportunity over the next 10 or 15 minutes to ask some questions, not only of our commissioners, but of our special guests as well. So could I ask our guests to, to um, join me in the front here at the podium? And Veena Sahajwala as well, our commissioner, perhaps you would like to join us and uh, uh, we, can, we can take uh, whatever questions are asked. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, what I'd do is hand over to Will to talk a little bit about fossil fuels and the limitations, and then perhaps can look at some, I can look at some of the mechanisms, if you want, that are in place around the world to deal with that. Yeah, basically the three big t ticket items are electricity generation, transport, and built infrastructure. And we've already heard some, some good thoughts from, from some of our guests. For example, efficiencies. You can go a long way simply be, by becoming much more efficient in how you use energy. And in a moment, I'm going to let Vina tell you a few stories about that. Electricity generation. Renewables are coming in at a much faster rate than anyone predicted, particularly in China, 
which has quickly taken over as the world leader in rolling out renewables. We know how to generate electricity by wind, by solar, and there'll be other renewables coming on stream in the next decades. They can do the heavy lifting, particularly in a country like Australia, which has an enormous solar resource. We still have challenges with storage and grid, but we're a creative species. We can solve that. Transport. There's some revolutionary things happening. For example, Volvo buses are now being rolled out in Beijing that are all electric, that charge up at every bus stop by induction underneath the pavement. Much less energy is used, no fossil fuels emitted. Basically, all those solutions are already out there. The challenge over the next couple of decades is to get them to scale. And increasingly, the economics are looking positive as the price of these go down and the price of fossil fuels goes up. So I'm pretty optimistic that we're at the cusp of really making that next revolution, next industrial revolution that, that humans make. But I'd like to, to let Vina talk about how big industry is actually getting in there and also uh, doing a lot of good things. Thanks, Will. And uh, just to take up the point that uh, Will left off at, which is really about industrial revolution, I think big businesses are really on board in many cases, uh, want to do the right thing in the context of looking at future technological solutions. And a lot of these future solutions are indeed going to be about reducing our dependency on coal. And I think what that then means, using the examples that uh, Will has provided, is looking at industries that have traditionally been dependent on coal. And I can certainly give you an example of the industry that uh, I work with in the steel sector. Certainly there is a huge drive to look at alternative resources. So if you're going to move away from coal, well, what else is out there? And I think that drive is certainly a reflection of how businesses are looking at alternative strategies, which are ultimately going to help us achieve the kinds of goals that we want, which is reduce our dependency on coal. I suspect that the uh, investment community will um, find the report confirming in relation to uh, much of what it's come to expect anyway. I think what this report has endeavoured to do is, as I said, um, try and give us some specificity as to actually what the magnitude of the task is over the next few decades, in, certainly in terms that, that I can understand. Um, I think the investment community will take that and simply put it into their their own models. Uh, it will confirm much of what the investment community already thinks. Uh, what it will be particularly doing though is giving, uh, providing more focus on that proportion of the corporate world that provides a solution to this problem. The other thing I would say is that, um, and the report makes this very plain, is that for each year that we go on and don't take the issue seriously, that the trends go up not down, say in terms of uh, fossil fuel consumption, the investment community, the business world knows that the magnitude of what has to be done later on gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, business will simply react, uh, you know, if we too delay, business will simply react accordingly and will have to um, increase the capacity for whatever is required um, at a later date. It's not what business wants, but if that's what the community uh, chooses to do, then business will react Sure. Um, when we we've recently conducted this uh, world first research, which has been um, interviewing community organisations right around the country um, to try and understand the scale of the problem, the risk associated with uh, what is happening in terms of extreme weather events, um, and whether or not we are ready. 
And there are two really important findings out of this research which complement the report this morning, one of which is we have a network of community organisations who are on the ground, who have the capacity to provide real leadership in terms of uh, recovery, in terms of preparedness and in terms of um, adaptation. Uh, but on the other side of it, uh, there has been very little work done on that front. I think the business community um, has been resourced and has been able to develop some further um, uh, sophistication around um, being the preparedness and the ability to adapt, whereas community organisations, for very understandable reasons, um, need to be better resourced to be able to do that work. Um, you will remember there were the tragic bushfires in Dunalley in uh, Tasmania earlier this year. We've been in regular contact with the head of the community organisation down there, the neighbourhood centre. Uh, when those bushfires hit, they downed tools on the work that they were doing, they opened their doors, they converted into the place where the community could come to get showers, to be able to meet very basic needs. Um, and they have continued to be working with individuals and families right now who have not been able to recover in any shape or form. And yet that community organisation has not been plugged into any of the higher level decision making around planning, um, nor um, until very recently did it receive any additional funding for it to be able to do the very important work that it has been doing with that local community. So in our view, there's been a major blind spot in terms of a, a national resilience uh, to our, uh, our work on preparedness and risk and adaptation, and that is the uh, community sector, which is large, it's well networked, it has incredible knowledge on the ground of who is vulnerable and where we need to be, um, and that is one of our major calls to be making sure that those community organisations and the leadership is inserted in to all of the decision making that is going on now um, and which needs to be expanded to make sure that we really are uh, prepared to deal with what we must deal with and we are also united in taking firm action to try and prevent uh, these extreme weather events from escalating even further. Yeah, sure. Look, look I think if I could just give you some takeaway points, I think the fact that we have such um, a wide range of guests speaking to this report tells you something about the significance of the report. As I said earlier, I do believe it's the Climate Commission's most important report to date. Uh, it's, it's been released about a quarter of the way through the critical decade. It gives us a very clear view of what the problem is. We've never had a clearer view of that. We also um, have some strong uh, uh, indications of pathways forward that the, the review gives us. And we've talked a little bit about those today in terms of the need of keeping the majority of the discovered reserves of fossil fuels in the ground, keeping them in the ground over time. Uh, we'll be releasing another report in the next month or so looking at uh, solar energy in Australia as a renewable resource. It will, I guess, build on this work looking at what the potential is for renewables into the future. Um, takeaway messages, the science is now very, very clear. The pathway forward is clear. There's a global agreement among governments as to what we need to do. Uh, this report is adding very significantly in terms of an understanding in the community and in business of what that actually entails. So thank you very much.